Thank you. Thank you very much. You can take your seats. When I assumed office 20 months ago, our country was facing tremendous economic challenges, escalating cost of essential household commodities, high fuel prices, rapid depreciation of the Kenya shilling, and spiraling public debt were threatening to ground our economy. My administration has worked hard and consistently so that today, the prices of essential commodities like unga have dropped from 240 shillings for a two kilogram packet to Kenya shillings 100, majorly attributed to our fertilizer subsidy program, the resilience of our farmers, and good rains that were given to us by God. During the period, we reduced the price of fertilizer also from 7,500 to 2,500. Petrol prices have come down to, from a high of 217 to now 187 a litre. The shilling has strengthened against the dollar from a high of 165 to now 127, 128. We have made significant progress in pulling the nation back from the brink of debt distress. Our debt situation is better managed and our budget now has space for investment and in programs aimed at easing the hardship on vulnerable people and creating opportunities for our young people. Our GDP grew by 5.6% last year, ranking Kenya among the 27 fastest growing economies in the world. Our inflation figures have fallen from a high of 9 and 8 in May last year to 5% in April this year. It is instructive for the nation to know that for every 100 shillings we collect as taxes, we spend 61 shillings in debt service. We have paid Kenya's Eurobond debt that was borrowed in 2014 of $2 billion that has been hanging around our neck. We paid the last installment of $500 million last week. Today, <clears throat> Kenya's debt burden is much less, more sustainable, and we are on course to redeem our country from the discomfort of debt and assert our sovereignty. Early this year, Treasury had proposed a budget of 4.18 trillion. I did direct that it be reduced by 200 billion to come down to 3.99 trillion. The finance bill 2024 generated to actualize this budget underwent public participation, which resulted to concessions by which we agreed to drop proposals on VAT on bread, motor vehicle circulation tax, VAT on locally manufactured diapers and sanitary pads, as well as excise duty on money transfer services, among others. The additional tax measures we had proposed in this year's finance bill were to raise money in the tune of 346 billion. When the concessions were, were made, subsequent to public participation that was undertaken by parliament, that came down to 200 billion. I had made this proposal, taking into account our situation and the priorities that are there. I want to thank the members of parliament seated behind me 
and those who voted yes for identifying the priority areas of our nation. Because when I made the proposals to parliament with my cabinet, we had certain critical priorities for the nation. Number one is our agriculture. We did make recommendations and part of the money we were going to raise from the finance bill was 10 billion shillings that will go to fertilizer subsidy, 18 billion shillings that would go to making sure that junior secondary school teachers, 46 of them, 46,000 of them would be confirmed on permanent and pensionable basis. We are very clear in our minds that education being the greatest equalizer, no child in Kenya should go to a school where there is no teacher or they, where there are no adequate teachers. It is because of that reason that in this finance bill also, we had committed to hire an extra 20,000 teachers. We also had envisioned to homes, especially in rural areas. We had committed 14.5 billion shillings, 50 million for every constituency for the last mile connectivity. Because we realize that there are many people who today cannot go to hospital because they cannot afford, because they have no health insurance. We had committed six billion shillings to operationalize our universal health coverage plan that would make it possible for every citizen to have a health insurance, those who cannot afford to be paid for by the government of Kenya, and to also operationalize the chronic illness fund that would make it possible for those who suffer from cancer, diabetes, hypertension, to be able to go to hospital, be treated, and go home without being asked for any money. We also had planned to put in money for our coffee farmers to retire the heavy debts that are bedeviling our coffee farmers. We also had allocated money for our sugarcane farmers to make sure that our sugarcane farmers out of the debts that they're in. We had also committed to our milk farmers two billion shillings to make sure that every farmer is paid a minimum of 50 shillings per liter to make sure that these farmers, very hard working citizens of our nation, get a fair return for their hard work and for feeding our nation. And that is why I commend these members of parliament for agreeing with us that all the priority areas I have mentioned were the right priorities to be funded. And by so doing, they supported the proposal to incorporate also the views of the people. These members of parliament came back to us after they went to listen to the people of Kenya. And they came back and reduced the budget on their own to by 146 billion sh shillings. Notwithstanding all these concessions, 
it has become evident that members of the public still insist on the need for us to make more concessions. And because I run a government, but I also lead people, and the people have spoken, I am grateful to all the members of the National Assembly who voted yesterday affirmatively for the Finance Bill 2024 as amended on the floor of the House to incorporate the views generated through public participation. And following the passage of the bill, the country witnessed widespread expression of dissatisfaction with the bill as passed, regrettably resulting in the loss of life, destruction of property, and disagression of constitutional institutions. On my own behalf, and on behalf of these members and many other Kenyans, I send my condolences to the families of those who lost their loved ones in this very unfortunate manner. Consequently, having reflected on the continuing conversation around the content of the Finance Bill 2024, and listening keenly to the people of Kenya who have said loudly that they want nothing to do with this Finance Bill 2024, I concede and therefore I will not sign the 2024 Finance Bill and it shall subsequently be withdrawn and I have agreed with these members that that becomes our collective position. <clears throat> Accordingly, there is need for us as a nation to pick up from here and go into the future. And I am therefore proposing that because we have gotten rid of the Finance Bill 2024, it is necessary for us to have a conversation as a nation going forward. How do we manage the affairs of the country together? How do we manage our debt situation together? How do we work on the budget with the deficits that now exist together? And as I committed last Sunday, I will be proposing an engagement with the young people of our nation, <clears throat> our sons and daughters, for us to listen to them, as I said on Sunday, listen to their views, listen to their proposals, their ideas, their concerns, and what they think we should do better as we go forward. I am also recommending a multi-sectoral, bipartisan, multi-stakeholder engagement from civil society, religious organizations, professional bodies, for us as a nation to speak to the future of our country, again together. And this will be on matters that are contained in the bill and matters that the people of Kenya have canvassed in the conversation that has been going on. In this regard as well, I am directing for immediate further austerity measures to reduce expenditure, starting with the office of the president, the entire presidency, 
and extending to the entire executive arm of government. Operational expenditure in the presidency be reduced to remove allocations for the confidential fort, reduce travel, hospitality, purchase of motor vehicles, renovations, and other expenditures. This will cover the entire presidency and also the executive arm of government. I also propose that equally, parliament, the judiciary, and county governments, working with the national treasury, also undertake budget cuts and austerity to ensure that we do live within our means respecting the very loud message that is coming from the people of Kenya. And let me confirm that I have discussed with many uh, stakeholders. I will be meeting some of them uh, shortly after this meeting on charting a way forward that makes sure that we carry the whole nation in this very important journey as we go into the future as a country. Let me also confirm that as we deal with austerity, the loud message on dealing firmly, decisively, and expeditiously with corruption is a matter that we have discussed and we have agreed that it will take the front banner as we go into the future. We will continue to do this and carry out this very important conversation. And I want to remind us that we should proceed within the foundational principles upon which our nation is founded, namely constitutionalism, adherence to the rule of law, and respect for constitutional institutions. We must continue to operate within the parameters of the law. I thank you. I will uh, take a few questions, three questions to be specific. Thank you, Your Excellency. And the first question will start with Elizabeth Mutuku from TV47. Good evening. My question is on young leaders from the Gen Z uh, generation who were abducted yesterday and uh, the, the day before yesterday. What happens to that? Second, there were young people who were killed during the demonstrations. What do you speak of that as the head of state? Thirdly, how do we move forward on the budget cuts, especially now that you've said that uh, we're going to have austerity measures, yes, but how then do we secure development? Thank you very much. Please. No, no, it's okay. So, I, um, I have said young people, six to be exact, six people yesterday lost their lives. Very unfortunately, they shouldn't have lost their lives. And I have said it is a very unfortunate situation. I wish that would not have happened. And there is a framework that will make sure that those six Kenyans who died yesterday will be accounted for. Number two, I did promise the country that there will be no extrajudicial killings going forward. And ever since I came into office, there is not one incident 
of extrajudicial killing. What you said about abduction are statements that were attributed to some of our civil society groups, but all the people they mentioned are, have since been found in police custody, and those that were already processed were already released. On the matter of development that you have said, minus the finance bill, it means that some of the development programs amounting to 200 billion shillings, we will have to cut down, to delay them. They will have to wait some of them for next year. We will try it again. Uh, we will try next year to find some money. Some of them um, we will have to uh, cancel because that's the nature of things. And it is because uh, the people of Kenya have spoken loudly that they want a leaner budget for us as a country. Question number two. We'll take the next question from Busara, K24. Nam, so langla kwanza ni eh, ni wazi kwamba uh, matumaini ya vijana wa Gen Z na baadhi ya wa Kenya kwa wabunge yamepungua kabisa ama hata yamepotea. Kwa hivyo kama rais unachukua hatua gani kuhakikisha kwamba tunawahusisha vijana katika maamuzi muhimu hasa katika masuala ambayo yanalenga taifa ama ujenzi wa taifa. Sasa so, lingine Je, yeah, utahakisha vipi uwazi katika mpango wako wa kupunguza matumizi serikalini? Maana yake umesema kwamba kuna austerity measures, je, yeah, kutakuwa na transparency. Na swali la mwisho ningependa kujua kama pengine kutakuwa na fidia kwa wale ambao walifariki, hasa kwa familia kwa wale ambao walifariki hapo jana, na je, yeah, serikali itasimamia malipo ya wale ambao wako hospitalini hivi sasa wanapokea matibabu kutokana na majeraha waliopata hapo jana? Asante. Thank you very much. Um, about 214 Kenyans were involved in various skirmishes, and many of them went to hospital. 95 of them were treated and released. Some of them, um, I think one is still in ICU, and others, I think 14, the minister is here, uh, are still in hospital. But majority of them were treated and released yesterday. As I have told you, on those who um, lost their lives, there will be a mechanism of how they will be accounted for. On the young people uh, whom you have said, how do we listen to them? Let me say the following. Number one, I did make a very clear, determined program to create opportunities for young people to work. It was in our manifesto. It is in my plan. As I talk to you, three of the programs are going on. The housing program today has 160,000 young people working as engineers, as architects, as quantity surveyors, plumbers, masons, carpenters, artisans, transporters, accountants. We have 160,000 young people working because I did take the decision that if we don't deal with millions of young people out of school, out of college, who have certificates and they don't have jobs, they will soon become a very big challenge for us as a country, as we are witnessing at the moment. All the young people you see, they are looking for opportunity. They are looking for jobs. And that is why our housing program, once it is fully rolled out, we will have a minimum of half a million young people working in our housing program.
Number two, I have been very clear on making sure that additional to our housing program is our digital infrastructure, the digital superhighway, the digital hubs, and the whole ecosystem of what we are doing in creating digital jobs. I was in Ruiru with Honorable King Kingara, who's right there, not, not more than a month and a half ago, launching a hub that will hire 4,500 young people under CCI. In this budget, we had added 10 billion shillings to CDF for them to be able to construct ICT hubs in each ward in the Republic of Kenya. That would give opportunities for two to three hundred young people in every ward to access internet, to be trained, to have a hub, and to monetize their digital skills. We will still find another way of implementing this plan, even if we have to cut back on CDF, if that is what is going to happen. Again, because we believe that young people deserve opportunity. As I talk to you, we've just concluded three bilateral agreements, one of them with Germany, on export of labor. Because we have negotiated with many countries who are interested in the high skills of Kenyan labor. And we have an ecosystem, we now have a plan on how we are going to make sure that the young people in Kenya get opportunities to work either in Kenya or outside Kenya. In fact, just this week, this week, last week, I saw um, on, the, on the headlines of one of the dailies, there was a gentleman from my village. He was put on the headline. And he said he, he operated from where I used to operate selling chicken. That's why they put him in the headline. And his complaint was, you see, the president has not done well because in this village, many people are going to look for jobs outside Kenya. That gentleman did not know that those people in our village that have gone to Saudi Arabia or UAE, I am the one who supported the program for them to go as part of the export of labor. So he thought that those people were going away because there were no jobs in Kenya. But it is part of this plan I have kept on talking about because I think it was called Misoy or somebody. If you go and check uh, the headline, I think, of uh, last week, Thursday or Friday, he was there. He didn't know the good young man that they, I think we have almost 500 or 400 and something people in around that village that have actually gotten jobs outside Kenya. And they are changing that village. And that is actually an admission by that gentleman that our plan on export of labor is working. And number two, that when we committed ourselves to making sure that we create opportunities for young people to work, we meant it. So we have a program on housing. We have a program on digital jobs. We have a program on export of labor. We have a program on the whole manufacturing sector. Let me give you another example. Now I'm, I'm talking this as a leader. We deliberately, last year, said we cannot continue to import products that we can manufacture in Kenya. 
One of them was clinker, cement, furniture, steel. What has happened the last one year? Very many, in fact five to be specific, companies have sought licenses in Kenya to do clinker, to do cement. And last year, because of what we did, we reduced the import of clinker by 95%. We saved foreign exchange. We created jobs locally. I was in West Pokot with my Minister for Industrialization. I'm sure the members of West Pokot, they are here. They were, they were there with me in West Pokot, opening a clinker factory that now hires 2,500 young Kenyans with another almost 2,000 as drivers, support staff, a big market now in, in West Pokot, expanding manufacturing in Kenya is the right thing. And it is the reason why some of our policy interventions on matters like imported stuff that are being manufactured in Kenya. For example, we have said substandard, low quality imported sanitary parts from China and other places. How can they come into Kenya when we have 10 companies in Kenya hiring Kenyan young people? How can they come and compete here? All the products that we are manufacturing locally, we must protect our local industries so that they create jobs locally, so that they create opportunities locally. In this finance bill, you will also see that we have imposed duty on um, potatoes from Europe, surely. How can we continue importing potatoes from Europe? And we have farmers right here in Kirinyaga. We have uh, uh, farmers right here in Nyandarwa, in Molo, in Timau. How can we justify? How can anybody take offense that we have imposed duty on imported potatoes? We have put duty on imported eggs, on imported onions, because we must protect our local farmers. Every country does that. Every country does that. I was negotiating with the Prime Minister of India because they are imposing duty on our avocados. I was in Korea negotiating with the government of Korea because they are imposing duty on our tea, on our coffee, and on our macadamia, including our uh, avocados. Every country does that to protect their market, unless there is a mutual agreement. So these are among us the things we are doing to make sure that we grow our local manufacturing, create local jobs, create local wealth. That is how we are going to move forward as a country. We cannot continue to be a supermarket for other people's factories. It is important that we also produce our own products. Our young people can produce products in Kenya which are of high quality, which are of international standard, and we can do that. So I just wanted to clarify this point because it is addressing the young people of our country. And I am looking forward to a conversation with my sons and daughters, the young people of this nation, to explain to them the opportunities that they have, and I want to listen to them what additionally do they want me to do? What can we do better? And how can we move the country forward together? Thank you very much. Thank you, Excellency. That marks the end of the question session. Thank you very much, Your Excellency.
Thank you. Thank you very much. You can take your seats. When I assumed office 20 months ago, our country was facing tremendous economic challenges, escalating cost of essential